Palu, Vipararshe, Uttama Shloka, Padayo, Chaya, Nirvrita, Chitanam, Nakutumbe, Spriha, Mati, Mahatam Kalu Viparshe, Uttama Shloka Padayo, Chaya Nivrita Chitanam, Nakutumbe Sprihamati, Mahatam Kalu Viparshe, Uttama Shloka Padayo, Chaya Nivrita Chitanam, Nakutumbe Sprihamati, Mahatam of great devotees. Kalu, certainly. Vipra Rishe, a great sage among the Brahmanas. Uttama Shloka Padayo, of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Chaya, by the shade. Nirvrita, satiated, Chitanam, whose consciousness, Na, never, Kutumbe, to family members, Spriha Matihi, consciousness with attachment. 
translation. Elevated Mahatmas who have taken shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are fully satiated by the shade of those lotus feet. Their consciousness cannot possibly become attached to family members. Purport. Srila Narottam Das Thakur has sung Nitai Pada Kamala Koti Chandra Shushi Tala Ye Chayai Jagata Judai. He describes the shade of the lotus feet of Lord Nityananda as being so nice and cooling that all materialists who are always in the blazing fire of material activities may come under the shade of his lotus feet and be fully relieved and satiated. The distinction between family life and spiritual life can be experienced by any person who has undergone the tribulations of a li of living the with a family. Of a li was of living with One who becomes under the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord never becomes attracted by the activities of family life. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 259, Param Drishtva Nivartante, one gives up lower engagements when he experiences a higher taste. Thus, one becomes a detached from family life as soon as he comes under the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. So here the discussion is coming up about how could Priyavrata be absorbed in family life since he was such a great devotee? So this aspect is, it's a very subtle point because here we have Parikit Maharaj and he is a great king himself, a great devotee of the Lord. He saw the Lord within the womb of his mother. So he's known for always searching out the Lord. And then here in these last days, he's sitting and he's hearing. Now we're in fifth canto. So he's heard quite a bit of the Bhagavatam, and especially all the technical elements. So now the question, the question that comes up is, how does one, how do these two, how are they applied, how are they mixed? Because one cannot do both. One can't be absorbed in Krishna and absorbed in family life. So how does this work? How would this function? So... The important thing is, is that the devotee, the being absorbed in the Lord, is not actually absorbed in family life. He performs the duties of family life, because that may be his position. In other words, whatever the position was in, whatever, one's, whatever is favorable, that's what one uses. So this is important to note, because otherwise we catch the element of devotional service, family life, they don't go together. But now there's also how this is applied. This is the more, I mean, the understanding of the philosophy, how the two work together is very delicate. But also very delicate is the application. So from the mode of passion, or in other words, from the position of fruit of activities, I do something because I want the result. And if I don't want the result, I don't do it. Right? Straightforward, right? So, if fam right? so then if family life is not useful in Krishna consciousness, therefore I don't do it, right? Natural logic, right? No? Yes. But that's the logic of the mode of passion. Right? Krishna says in the Gita, one giving, giving up one's duties because they're troublesome. That's the mode of passion. Mode of goodness is you do your duties because that's what you're supposed to do. Right? If you don't do them, who's going to do them? Right? You know, you know, you, you, unless you have a, a stand-in or something like that. But does that make sense? You know. So the point is, is it's the Vedic culture is based on the mode of goodness. It's Brahminical culture. So this Brahminical culture means it's practiced in the mode of goodness. That's what makes it stand out from others. So even we see some people are following Vedic culture. Are they following the mode of goodness, right? One's born in a particular family, so that is the, the condition that you're in, right? So that means it's based on the body. So then that's the mode of ignorance. Or if, you're, if you acknowledge the soul, but then you say that, that's a shudra soul, or a shudra, that's a mode of passion. 
So in other words, one has to understand it's not just it's the Vedic culture or it's Grihastha life or it's these... One has to know, well, what mode are you applying it through? Because if that's not appreciated, then this is one of these very big discussions that generally ends up in, you know, Grihastha life is useless or Grihastha life's the only real thing and all everybody else is just pretending. So that kind of useless, you know, how you say, political, uh, bodily conscious, uh, how you say, argument is, uh, how you say, sustained on the modes of passion and ignorance. So here's what's being introduced, which is something quite new and quite uh, unique, you could say, in the non-Vedic cultures. It means even in the Vedic culture it's hard to find. But in the non-Vedic cultures it's practically non-existence. This concept of performing your duties because you're supposed to. Right? It means you do have a few cultures where performance of duty is considered good. At least it used to be in the British, but I think that's quickly disappearing. Or if it's something to do with the national, you know, go fighting for your country or, you know, fighting for somebody's rights, then that's, then that's okay. But you're still fighting because the fruit of result you'll get, it's still based on extended sense gratification. So it's not actually the mode of goodness. There's the sense of duty, yes. So that concept is there, but it's only accepted when it's with the passion and ignorance. But this concept of duty, free from passion and ignorance, or it's just the mode of goodness, is totally foreign to the Western mind. Therefore, the concept, just do your duty, then it becomes dry and boring and no personal interaction. Right? Or then it's just totally absorbed because this is we're just being real Prabhu. So none of these, the, all of these have missed the mark. They're not a standard to even discuss from. If someone takes this as a standard to discuss and push it, they're totally wrong. They don't have a position. I mean, unless they're happy to say, yes, I'm in the mode of passion or ignorance and, you know, and, and that's the way it is and, you know, you're going to have to take it or leave it. You know, of course, we leave it. But the point is, is it's, it's not enough that you just have the form. It's how it's used. What's the attitude it's used? Someone can cook very expertly, but if the attitude is wrong, it's not Krishna conscious. It won't please Krishna. Does this make sense? Right? So it's very, very important that the attitude goes along with it, seeing that bhakti is based on the attitude. But because the results are for Krishna, that's why the skill is applied. So now another uh, fallacy is that since it's just for Krishna, it's just the mood, therefore the skill absolutely doesn't matter. We don't have to try to develop nice skill, nice knowledge, nice technique. It's also, this is also an accepted, well accepted path, right? It's known as Sahajya. You know, easy, very popular. I mean, probably there's more Sahajyas there in Bengal than there are, you know, proper Gaudiya Vaishnavas, right? So the thing is popular, you know, and since popular is the thing these days, then yes, it, it seems to fly, but it also doesn't have any basis. The point is, is if it's for me, then I have to have the knowledge and the skill to get the result I want. But if it's for Krishna, then it doesn't matter. No. The point is, is the same endeavor you make for yourself, you should be making for Krishna. That's same. So just as hard as one works for oneself, one works for Krishna. Prabhupada points that out, is how hard the karmis are working, the devotees should at least be working that hard, if not harder. Because they're just doing it for themselves, so sometimes they're inspired, sometimes not. But we're doing it for Krishna. We're always inspired. So we can see here that there's some fundamental uh, misunderstandings that Pariket Maharaj is bringing out here that we have because of the conditioning of fruit of activities, that we only do something if we're going to get a result. 
And if we're not going to get the result, we don't do it. Or if we add in, okay, it's for Krishna, then we do it, but without actually any proper endeavor. It's just whatever we feel like. Since it's bhav, it's just it's all for Krishna, then it's whatever I feel like. So in other words, we sneak that mode of passion in there somehow. Okay, it's varnasham, but what am I getting out of it? You know? Or it's, 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 it's just, yeah, it's for Krishna, but, you know, it's just then whatever I feel, my independence, my controlling and enjoying. Does this make sense? Or since I'm, okay, we're not going to get anything, yeah, we don't do that, then I'm not going to do it. Or, okay, I will do it, but I'll do it very grudgingly. You know, I'm not going to be nice to the family. I'm not going to be nice to anybody because I'm only doing it because of duty. Does that, does that make sense? So these are all motive, passion, and ignorance. We see here is that the devotees act very nice because this is the duty. This is the natural position. In other words, it's just like, let's say, when you greet somebody. You know, the Western culture, they greet somebody, they shake their hand. How much focus is on the hand? How much is more on the mood? So the shaking of the hand, or what you say, that's just a medium for the expression. But it's done. You can't say, well, it's all about the mood so we don't have to shake. No, it's a matter of that's the way you express the mood. So the duties are the way you express the devotion and the interaction with, with Krishna and the devotees. So from that, then it takes on a whole new dynamic. So in other words, it, become, it has that element of purity. But at the same time, it has that, that dynamic, spontaneous element that comes from doing something because one wants to do it. So it becomes very, very nice. So we see as all the pastimes that we see in the Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Chaitamita are all very wonderful. Why? Because they're performing these activities of goodness to please Krishna. So in other words, pure goodness. Then it becomes very nice. So we'll see that these devotees are doing them very well. Because if you don't do them very well, everybody's not happy. Right? Duties aren't enough. Just like, oh, I cooked, you know. Oh, but, but, but Prabhu, you know, you should be happy. You know, you're cooking for Krishna. Well, what's the problem? What's all this, you know, sentiment stuff? I cooked. Isn't that good enough? Right? What would you say? Would, would that be okay? No. But if you say, you know, well, how come you're not nice to the family? Hey, I take care of them. Isn't that enough? Bang, right between the eyes. You understand? It's the same logic. But this is the problem. We don't understand that when it's, when it's with dealing with people, then that's where all the etiquette, all those things come in. So the idea is knowledge and skills is the basis. And getting good results are the basis, but those are being done for Krishna. And then you add into that the etiquette, and then everything works very, very nicely. So it's a very, very clear culture, but if we don't catch the subtleties of the modes and the attitude, then it doesn't come off very palatable. It just, it just doesn't. Does this make sense? Yeah, how are we doing on time? Yeah. So much of the time when, when these, these things are applied, if it's not applied with the right attitude, no one appreciates. Like Prabhupada, he would apply the Vedic culture. Everyone appreciated. Other devotees apply. Sometimes it's appreciated, sometimes not. But what happens? The individual doesn't get the blame. The Vedic culture gets the blame. The devotional culture gets the blame. The philosophy gets blamed. Right? So that's the, the, the problem. You know what I'm saying? If the person takes a knife and goes crazy and runs around and is, you know, stabbing people, cutting things, is the knife to blame? No. So therefore, one should never blame the Vedic culture, the philosophy, Prabhupada's teachings, any of these things. It's how they're applied. So here we see is that it's not the grihasta ashram that's the problem. It's the attitude. So here Priyavrata is applying it perfectly. And Parikit Mars is inquiring how is that how does that work? How does that happen? Like that. 
So here is pointing out, if one takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, then one can balance all these things very, very nicely. Right? That's the key, is that it's being done for Krishna. It doesn't change what's happening. It changes who the result is for. Right? And then if you see that, okay, you need to change some of what you're doing because the result won't come out so nice for Krishna, then that's, that's favorable. Yes. Okay. Any questions or comments? Yes. In the back. Is he an example for Grihastha Ashrama? Yeah. Can we take uh, the teachings from the Bhagavatam through this example uh, as an example for Grihastha Ashrama people? Yes. Why not? There's some doubt. Because uh, mostly this uh, uh, the King Prayvata's <laughs> example is not quoted um, frequently in uh, lectures or, you know. So, who, who is frequently quoted? <coughs> and mostly we see like Prahad Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj, these are very exalted examples uh, from Bhagavatam. Yeah, well, they're more prominent stories. Like that. This element is, is there, but it's also it's just the, you know, full... <coughs> Prabhupada would speak a lot. When he traveled, he'd speak on the teachings of Prahlad Maharaj. Right? That, Queen Kunti's prayers, these were very, you know, Kapila Muni's instructions. These were prominent um, lectures that Prabhupada would give. If you look at his lectures when he would travel, these would be what he'd mostly be speaking on. So, but it's not that because someone's not quoted that it's not used. Like that. It means any of these great personalities because they're bringing out different aspects, right? Like in Priyavrata Maharaj, you see his training as a brahmachari, right? And so therefore, that's how he's such a good grihasta because he's such a good brahmachari. Because in a brahmacharya, then you have to learn to perform your duties, not for yourself. And as expected, you're going to do them well. So now you just do the same thing in family life. Now you do it with, you know, instead of with, you know, some crazy brahmacharis, you do it with a family, right? For political correctness, we drop the term crazy there, but, yeah, okay? Yes? Does that make sense? But, but, and, but Kardama, then it was as a brahmachari, how he took up Grihastha life, how he got married, how he, he took care of his wife. Right? So different persons, you see how, how they're taken care of. Yudhishthir, how he would uh, preach the philosophy to Draupadi. Right? It means, you know, the proper philosophy, but in a very nice tone. Or, or if she's insulted, how Bhima, uh, Bhima would take up and, you know, remove the obstacles. You know what I'm saying? So all these different grihastas, you see all the different aspects are being done. Because you, you work according to what you're working with. So this isn't a verse on how to work in family life in detail. This is, this is verses on what is the view of one's situation in grihasta life. You know what I'm saying? Because when you get into duties, then there's the nature of man, nature of woman, nature of the family, nature of all these things, nature of the social environment. So you apply all those. Right? But this is about just understanding that material life doesn't actually have anything to offer. Just, it doesn't. There's the idea it does. Everybody says it'll work. Right? You know, it's just like you get a bunch of 
you know, a late night party and all the guys are there and, you know, they're all fairly well drunk and then they all decide, hey, let's do this and they think it'll be great, but it doesn't turn out great. And anybody standing by who's not drunk can understand this is stupid. But, you know, they think it's cool. So the whole point is just because the whole world thinks you're going to get something out of the material world doesn't mean it will. There is no history, right? There's history of who was the king. There's history of who invented something or who came up with a philosophy, right? Does that make sense? And, you know, based, you know, when someone was born and when they died and how they died. No one discusses much how they're born, but always how they died. Okay, did I leave anything out? Oh, excuse me, whether they were wealthy or not. Okay, did I leave something out? Is there anything where it said someone was happy or satisfied? Any history, right? 5,000 years of Western history, right? 3,000 recorded. Any examples? Not one because there isn't any. But the problem is everybody is thinking I will be happy. So this is pointing out you can't be. So how is it Priyavrata Maharaj is so happy in household life? Because he's a devotee, he's absorbed in Krishna. That's how it's working. It's not because of the family. Family life can't give satisfaction. Devotional life can so the proper performance of one's duties in household life to please Krishna, that can give satisfaction. But it's the devotion, not the thing itself. Does that make sense? So that's the point to, to get up here. The detail is not being... That's other parts of the story or other stories we'll give. Is that okay? Yes. This principle which you have spoken about today and in general, the culture of the mode of goodness. In your opinion, how can ISKCON better apply this principle which you spoke about, and in general, the culture of goodness? Currently, is there any specific methodology or, you know, suggestions that you have how it can be better implemented okay well, we'll dis suggestions will work with but opinion will dispense with because basically my opinion what does it matter right like that so um Prabhupada's, it means the proper action is based on proper understanding and proper knowledge because if you're looking at a practical application of something, before one can act, one has to know what is the field that you're working with. You have to know what is the purpose of that field, what you can gain. You have to know what all the elements within the field, what they're doing, and, and what would be the proper application. Knowing this, then one can have the, applying the proper attitude, then one can get results. So most of the time is knowledge is not complete, attitude's not complete. So it's not that the devotees don't have all the knowledge or have the attitude. It's just they don't always apply it. Because if you sit down and anybody who's studied, you know, to some degree Prabhupada's books, they have the knowledge to actually do what Priyavrata Maharaj is doing. Right? They, they have, but the attitude is like when I'm sitting and chanting or I'm in the kirtan or I'm doing some service somewhere like that where you can see it's directly connected to the temple or that. Then that service mood is there, the knowledge is there. But when it goes outside of this, when it goes into what's beyond the morning program, that's where it generally falls apart. But all it is is they don't see that it's the same connection. Like if you can cook potatoes, you can cook cauliflowers. The technique is the same. Detail may be different. Right? You know, potato, if it burns a little bit, it's fine. Cauliflower, you don't really want to burn it. 
you know, but the same element of applying heat and all those different things is the same. So what happens is it's the transferal of the technical knowledge they know from one field to the next, that's where the lacking is. So that's why either one has to associate with those who can do that or um, hear about how to do it and then apply that technically in the life and understand its importance because if it's not seen as important it won't be taken like much of the time if it doesn't make money no one cares right if it makes money like I remember uh, up to when it was mid 90s we were doing the yagya you know that the the, the egg shala was there we do the radhamadava's yagya and everything like that Basically, if there were any visiting devotees, every day I get a lecture about this is not Treta Yuga and Hari Nam is the Yuga Dharma. You know, like that. Every day, like that. You know, you know, where is this and shot like this. You know, it's 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 eleventh canto when Krishna explains to to Uddhava about deity worship. Doing a yagya for the deities, satisfaction with deity mantras, is part of you know elaborate deity worship. But whatever, you know, eleventh canto is definitely not a popular canto. You know, so whatever it is. So that every day was that. Until sometime in the 90s, someone figured out you could make oodles of money from the Hindus if you did yagyas. And that was the last day I ever heard of this is Treta Yuga, this, that, blah, right? You know, so, you know, so that's the whole point. Is so until it's understood that consistency in people's endeavor gets you the maximum result. And consistency in people's endeavor is because they're individuals is based on their individual inspiration. And their individual inspiration is depending upon how they're culturally dealt with and what is their proper understanding. If that was understood, the long term picture of making money, then it would be if I don't behave nicely with them and I don't educate them, then I won't get long term results. I won't get stableness. So therefore, then it would be, and you see those persons who work on bigger cycles of, of results, they do deal nice. They are educated. They do try to educate. They do deal in a cultured way. And they're the ones with the biggest results, sustainably. And others can get big results, and then it disappears like a, like a, you know, like a grass fire. It flares up big and disappears. So that's the, the element is that, okay, I could get a little bit more now by not following etiquette, but if I followed etiquette over the long run, I would get many, many times more. So then, at least from that perspective, then it might be appreciated. Yes. Uh, just a supplementary question. That uh, achar prachar. Hmm. And I read somewhere, either in um, uh, Nectar of Devotion, where Rupa Goswami makes a very strange point, where he says that to the effect that prachar is not enough, but that to go back home, back to Godhead, one also needs achar, proper behavior. So, again, I'm going back to Iskan because that's you know, we're connecting it, like Pragosh Prabhu said, connecting the Bhagavatam to the class. <laughs> that, that, that way you can get away with it. <laughs> yeah, of course. But do you think, how can we, as individual devotees, I mean, our behavior, we can start with ourselves and our relationships with other devotees. So do you think that's an important element that we, you know, such out some path or methodology where we can improve our achar even if it's only within our own society with each other is that important or is it uh, sentimental or what no it's very important see sentiment is not a problem if it's based on proper knowledge and, and tradition because the idea is that vaidi is performed with proper sentiment if it's performed with sentiment without proper knowledge, that then becomes sentimental. 
And if it's just properly performed without the proper sentiment, then it becomes dry and ritualistic. So the Gaudiya line is that Vaidhi is performed with, prop, with nice mood. So the, the achar is very, very important because if that's there, then the dealings will always be nice. So whether they're dealing in a more traditional way or not, at least they're nice. But if you don't use the, 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 this Vedic achar, this Gaudiya achar, then the Western achar is very superficial. You know, somebody's very, very nice to whoever they feel like being nice to and whoever they don't, then there's a problem. It's just like, let's say, you go out of your way. It means the whole idea is that you want a people's rights and protection of people's rights, right? So therefore, you know, we'll do anything, let's say, to protect, you know, some species of life. But then those who we feel are obstructing the rights of that species of life, we can go and blow up their, their offices, sink their boats, you know, do all kinds of nasty things to them. But if the principle is rights and life, what, what about that other person's rights? You just blew up his office. Doesn't he have a right to have an office? You know, maybe you don't like what he does with his office. That's another thing. But you blew up his office. You know, you're saying, well, you, you know, you destroy their habitat. You know, so it's... it's it's inconsistent. So that's because of the mode of passion. They identify the soul with the body. So therefore, you know, blue whale souls are good, you know, and, you know, how you say, oil magnate souls are not good. You know, but it, it, it doesn't, doesn't, it's without proper understanding. So the Western sentiment, the Western morality and all that will always fall short. It's a, you can start from there. If one has some, some Western moralistic sentiment, it's all right to start from there. You start from wherever you are, that you're conditioning. But it doesn't have enough depth to actually uh, bring satisfaction in Vaishnav interactions then it's a matter of what Lord Chaitanya recommends, the humility, tolerance, respect of others, not looking for respect for oneself, you know, offering food, accepting food, giving gifts, accepting gifts, uh, speaking confidentially, you know, uh, and, and hearing confidentially. But we notice that these mediums, those aren't there. Means the person, if we're dealing with justice, one group can be completely enraged and the other group has to be totally humble. Where's the balance? You know, comes to food, generally, I, I haven't heard means, to, you know, if I'm in my own circles, but when I'm outside the circles, it's rare to find where you sit to take prashad. People just talk about prashad or nice or it's good. It's always, you know, too much sugar, too much ghee, not enough this, not enough that, I'm not healthy. It has nothing to do with that. You can't eat. You know, plus, no one knows serving, no one knows all these things. It's, it's lost. You know, back previously, everyone knew how to serve and deal and everything. You know, basically, you know, knew how to cook. And so it's, that whole aspect is there. It's not valued. You know, now it's, you know, buffet, go get it yourself. There's no serving, you know, kind of thing. You know, gifts, you know, definitely don't want to do that. You know, and whatever is in an area belongs to that area. It's like that's their, they stake their claim. You know, it's kind of like, so where's the gifting, the taking? And confidentiality, forget it. You know, if the internet, anything you say within five seconds is on the internet. So that means the mediums for actually interacting with devotees are gone and they're not accepted as bona fide. And these other things of respecting others, not looking, the, the whole, where's the etiquette? So without that, you don't actually have human society. But the potency of devotional service, even the non-humans can practice it. So that's the benefit that's going on, is that because devotional service is so powerful, even like Shivananda Sen's dog, you know, was, you know, elevated. So that's the position. But the satisfaction of social interaction and all that would be there so much greater. The devotee's satisfaction would be there if... They would follow these things, but follow themselves. The duty means, mode of goodness means I focus on what I should do, not what everybody else should do. You know, because the general thing is, is 
everyone knows what everybody else should be doing, right? You know, everyone's an expert on whatever, but never on what they're supposed to do. So mode of goodness is you focus on what you're supposed to do, and if you do that and everybody does that, then everything gets done. But if I focus on what everybody else should do and they're focusing on what I'm supposed to do, who's doing it? That's the problem, you know? So it's a very simple thing because as devotees, they have the adhikar, they have that purity, and they have the method that they could easily apply it. It's just a little practice. But one only practices something one values. If one thinks this is important, I'll practice it. If one doesn't think it's important, one doesn't practice it. That's, it, it's, it's fairly simple, you know? I mean, detail will be, you know, of course, time, place, and circumstance, so maybe how you have to apply it will be very, you know, much effort is needed, but the principle is very, very simple. Is that okay? Okay, yes. Hey, Maharaj, uh, I would like you just to explain from his statement what Rupa Goswami meant by char and achar, so everyone understands clearly that point. It means 150 grams of salt, is that 100 grams of salt? Uh... <laughs> no, no, just the, the, the principle of oh, how okay. Rupa Goswami meant that. Okay. Okay. Um, see, for Krishna, it's all about rasa, because technique, he's perfect. He's satya sankalpa. Anything he desires happens, because him and his energies are non-different. And since whatever there is to be performed, his energies can perform it, and his energies are non-different from him, anything he thinks up will happen. So skill isn't what's important to Krishna. But skill is the natural medium. Right? In other words, expertise is Krishna's expert, his energies are expert. So being expert at something is natural. That's why when a devotee is not very expert at something but has the ability to improve, you always encourage them to improve, not just stay wherever they're at. But if someone doesn't have the ability, you leave it, right? Because there's different manifestations of the energy, some very great, some smaller. So the the idea that one is doing thing, something well, that's considered your baseline. Then what improves above that is the quality of the attitude. So that's where the etiquette comes in, is because the appreciation. Everything's connected to Krishna, it's all about Krishna, so if anybody's doing anything to please Krishna, that's what's important, not that I'm the one pleasing Krishna. So there's no fight as such. There's no, in other words, any fighting or any competition is not based on envy. It may be based on jealousy, not envy. Because envy is destructive. They're doing, I must stop them doing it, someone else does. Like that. So then, then uh, but jealousy is they're doing so nice for Krishna, we'll also do so nice for Krishna. You know, this way then it, it, it increases, it gets better and better. And the best part about it is, is Krishna, because he's unlimited, he expands, and so everybody gets to do that extra uh, specialness for Krishna. That's why Goloka is so big, right? Because you have to have unlimited manifestations so all the different devotees or groups of devotees can excel. Right? So for Rupa Goswami, it's that interaction. So now Krishna, if we think about it, Krishna is Krishna conscious. But that's not what's important to him. What's important to him is, you know, means personally for himself. That he's Krishna conscious isn't what like, stands out to him, of, about himself, to himself. What, Im, what, he, what impresses him is the mood of the devotees. So, the, you could say the basis of being Krishna conscious is, like we said, being expert. Being Krishna conscious is the baseline. But being focused on the devotees, that's what attracts Krishna. So he's attracted by devotees. So if you're attracted by devotees, then Krishna, then there's something to do with Krishna. Otherwise, if you only like him, okay, that's great for Vaikuntha, but he wants to interact with the devotees. 
Vaikuntha means he sits there on his throne. Everyone comes there, offers prayers and that, and they're fanning their chamaras, and, and it works great. But for personal interaction, we see when Gopu Kumar went there and was playing flute and interacting, it didn't work so good. They had to take him to the side and kind of read him the riot act. You know, said, so, you know, we don't do that around here. You know? So then, you know, so, yeah. So, so then, but in Vrindavan, it's all about the devotees. When you're hearing about something, it's about the devotees. Right? It means Agasura, it's about the devotees. You know, uh, the playing with the monkeys and the coward boys, it's the devotees, the coward girls, mother just showed it. It's all about the devotees. So if one doesn't have proper etiquette with devotees, then for, for Krishna, there's no common ground. Right? Just that you're conscious of Him. That's why Rupa Goswami says favorably conscious. Right? You know, Prabhupada makes a point. First become conscious, then become Krishna conscious. If you're not conscious, how do you even know how to be Krishna conscious? But the point is that Krishna conscious must be favorable. Because otherwise, Shishupal is also Krishna conscious. Right? It's, we just heard, I think it was Jayabhadakumar was saying, or, or Purushottamara was saying that before he could speak, he was already insulting Krishna. Right? So as soon as the first word's coming out of his mouth, instead of mommy or daddy, it's some insult to Krishna, right? You know? So this, this is, you know, this is a, this is a A-class demon, right? You know, so you're not going to get better than that, right? You know? So, so, conscious of Krishna, but it has to be favorable. That's why this is thrown in. Otherwise, we're just conscious on the Brahman level or Paramatma. This is my duties. I'm doing my duties. You know, so I'm doing that to please Krishna. Yes, but why would Krishna want you to do those duties to please him? That's the Bhagavan level. That's there where for etiquette comes in. Because otherwise the first two levels can be very dry. Don't have to be, but tend to be. But the Bhagavan level actually can't be dry. So if it's dry, it's not actually functioning fully on that platform. The other two are mixed. So the element is that the devotee is there, devotee is dear to Krishna, I have to deal with them nicely. Right? It's not just the rule, it's not just justice, it's not just morality, it's, it's, it's not just dharma, but it's, it, the sad dharma is that relationship with Krishna. So that's what Rupa Goswami is pointing out. Is that okay? Very good. Anything else? Harish, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for such a nice Maharaj, we are, uh, we perform Vaidhi Bhakti, so like in the beginning there is a cross manifestation of our advancement in Krishna consciousness. We see our consciousness is changing and all that. Over a period of time, say let us say 10 years, 15 years or more, uh, we try to do, we try to balance, we try to be in mode of goodness, we try to do our sadhana, we try to do our duties. So how do we determine that we are advancing in Krishna consciousness? Okay. First, I wouldn't use that, that advancing Krishna consciousness by saying consciousness would be gross. Because seeing that the body, that's gross. Then subtler than that is the mind, intelligence, false ego. Then subtler than that is consciousness. So, does that make sense? Right, gross means he's not between washing pots. He's not out the back door smoking cigarettes. That's gross. You understand? So he stopped that. Now you can tell he's advancing. But consciousness, that's always what you're looking for. Point is, is that when you're advancing, then, okay, you're, you mentioned a line of things, motive, goodness, performing duties, you know, proper knowledge, all these things. But why are you doing those? You understand? The beginning, I'm doing these because this is what I'm supposed to do. This is the recommendation. Right? But after a while, advance it means then you're doing that to please Krishna. So then it's not about the mode of goodness and the performance of duties and the knowledge. It's about pleasing Krishna with their applying in Krishna's service that he's pleased. You know what I'm saying? I got it done, but were the Vaishnavas satisfied? Is Krishna satisfied? Right? Does that make sense? So then advancement will be one can contemplate these things right it's natural you perform uh, karma yoga then knowledge and detachment comes so then jnana yoga can be performed by the devotee right then naturally that then it comes to jnana yoga you're able to meditate on the lord 
Does that make sense? And then all these three, the body is engaged, the intelligence is engaged, the mind is engaged, that's buddhi yoga. So that's what Krishna is recommending. But why you're doing that is because it pleases Krishna. Therefore, sarva dharma prityaja. You don't give up performing your do duties in the mode of goodness. You perform doing them because they're in the mode of goodness. Right? You know what I'm saying? We're not vegetarian because it's mode of goodness. We're vegetarian because it pleases Krishna. You understand? Because otherwise, if we're vegetarian to please ourselves, then you could go any direction with that. You know, I think it's good. So then whatever's popular that's also good can change. Does that make sense? Maharaj, you were mentioning uh, this uh, uh, nana, uh, karma yoga and then it goes to gnana and then it goes to dhyana in, in this way. So, uh, is it that uh, while performing Vaidhi Bhakti, for uh, uh, anyone who performs Vaidhi Bhakti, they, go, they have to go through, like we hear that anyone Shudras or Vaishyas, uh, Shudras or any low class person can practice Krishna consciousness and he can go back home, back to God. What does low class mean? What's the definition of low class? One who is in mode of ignorance or... Okay, but, but, but you mentioned, okay, so then mode of ignorance. So is your businessman in, in the mode of ignorance, the mundane businessman? Generally, the businessmen are vaishya, so... Yeah, but is he in the mode of ignorance? Does he know Krishna? No. No. What about the kshatriyas? Do they know Krishna? No. What about the, the modern intellectuals? Do they know Krishna? No. Okay, that's your definition of low class. Devotee is high class. You understand? Within low class, right? Then you have your divisions. Just like within garbage, right? There's divisions, right? There's plain glass, there's colored glass, there's organics, there's paper, plastics, right? But it's all garbage, right? So within mundane, then you have Brahma, Shatya, Vaishya, Shudra. And that's still low class. But Brahman low class is better than Kshatriya low class, better than Vaishya low class, better than, like that. You understand? But devotee, now that's high class. So devotee is a Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, they're all high class. Then it's just a matter of what part you play in the social machinery. That's all. It's not a matter of, of once. A devotee who's a Shudra is not more low class than a Brahmin who's a devotee. You understand? It's just what duties they do. That's all. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. So we'll end here. Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Samaveta Bhaktivarinda ki, Jainatai Gaur Premanam.